over me. Awesome. <laughs> so we've come together. You, That's right. <laughs> you spent a lot of time living in, the, in Europe. I mean, you come from the US, but you've spent years, 16 years or so, you told me. Yeah. But when, in, the, in the work you're in and what you discover, what are, what are the differences? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, taught me, it's taught me a lot. One is, you know, I took a big risk in, in, in coming over. Um, it's not easy to move internationally. And you know, so that, that risk-taking aspect was... Was, uh, was there, and you know, the very first trip I ever took was to Amsterdam, and had no place to stay. I was with some friends walking down. I don't know if anyone's ever been to Amsterdam. It's, uh, in, the, in the summer, it's, it has about you know, millions of people there in, on tourists, and the Damstraat is full, hundreds of thousands of people. And a gentleman pulled up to us on a bicycle, and he said, hey, you guys are looking for a room. I've got something. We were scared. Uh, he convinced us to come and, and, and view his apartment, which was amazing. And this guy turned out to be a, a very famous Dutch designer. His name is Marcel. And you never know who you're going to meet, mm. right? And that's, that's the one amazing thing I, I always felt about Europe was you, you just never know who you're going to meet. That doesn't happen in New York or Washington? Or? Uh, a lot of similarities. <laughs> 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 uh, and I think, I think the other piece is, uh, is the perspective. You know, you... you and I'll, I'll make a small comparison. You, you, you drive down a street, a street in the United States. It could be any city. It really doesn't matter. And almost every block, you'll have a McDonald's, a Burger King, a Kentucky Fried Chicken. And then one mile later, you'll have a McDonald's, a Kentucky <laughs> Fried Chicken, a Burger King, and then maybe a few pharmacies. But you go 100 miles in any direction from, say, Amsterdam. You're in another country. You're in another, a whole other culture. And um, that gives you a lot of perspective. And, and I've been fortunate to, to visit or live significantly in, in over 45 countries since that time frame, and including Asia and other places. So it really gives you a lot of empathy. <laughs> Go and show us how your knowledge of the world will help the internet and its security. <laughs> well, I really, I really hope so. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, Chris, and, and thank you very much to, to Real Secure Renato. I mean, this is an, 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 amazing, an amazing opening. Uh, honestly, the best I've ever seen in a security conference, and I've been to quite a few, and I, I would like this to be multiplied over, uh, over the world because that combination of, of artistic and, and technical is something that we hear from guys like Jobs, Steve Jobs and, 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 and Walter Isaacson and, and the big famous guys. But where do you ever see it come together in a security conference? And I, and I think this is probably the first time I've ever seen it really kind of come together, right? And I, I'm, I'm just that huge believer in, you know, the lessons you can, you can learn from history, right? And I think it's up, let's see what's going on. Something's not being displayed, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep going on. So I'm just a big believer in uh, you know, that combination of, of art and technology and learning those, those lessons of, of history. So today we're talking about you know, how we rethink cyber. And I don't know if, if any of you guys know this, but uh, this year is the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus. And anyone in the audience know what the Bauhaus is? There has to be one. There's one. Okay. <laughs> what, what is the Bauhaus, sir? <laughs> Real quick. Exactly, famous, famous German, and, and led by an Austrian, exactly, um, from the beginning. So 100-year anniversary today, right? It started in 1919, ended in 1933, or closed, the, the school closed in 1993, or excuse me, <laughs> 1933. But that didn't mean that their influence stopped. In fact, it's gone worldwide. So, but they had a lot of great ethos and philosophies that we can take into cyber, right? We can take into security. Right? I think there's a lot of technical people in, in cybersecurity, but... We need to bring a bit more of those artistic components together and thinking about how we're designing products. So think about what the Bauhaus talked about, this total design ethos, meaning craftsmanship and artistic work coming together. They believed in multicultural and, and, and you know, training from the ground up. So their, their initial school probably had five or six different, at least five or six different nationalities in place. Where do you get that perspective? Right? It comes together. They believed in form, over, form and function. Right, so it's simplistic. Easier is better. Right? Think of a chair. Anybody have heard of a chair called the Wasili? It's, it's a very famous chair. It's black and white, exposed chrome. It kind of, you sit kind of in an angle. It's not that comfortable. <laughs> I've sat in a few, but nonetheless, 
it's very, it's very cool, very simplistic, very stylistic. You know, and if you're a minimalist type person, you want ease of use, it's a great chair, right? But that's, they're, they believed in exposing the technical aspects, but making it very, very easy for customers to use. So think about that when you're looking at security products or you're designing security products, how can you take those design lessons to heart and start thinking about the architectures or the products that you're building and following those lessons? So let's take a, take a little look. So let's look at the, at the state of, you know, what, what are we being faced with today? The state of transformation in, in industry. What is the CISO being faced with? What are you faced with? What is Real Secure faced with when they want to when they want to secure people, right? They're faced with about five. There's five different things, really big projects that are trending, right? One is you know, we call the digital workplace, and I think almost every company here is undergoing that. It's been happening for some time, and the new things that are happening. Of course, you're adopting cloud services, right? So there's a new attack services there. Lots of new services that are being there, being used there. You're adopting mobile to to the greater extent than you ever have. So another types of new new uh, operating system, new operating, new risk vectors. But then you have things like IoT that are, that are being uh, deployed in your buildings and becoming a growing concern. So that all fits into that smart device protection. So a lot of new attack surfaces to consider. Now think about the other aspect, service transformation, right? So moving you know, your infrastructure. We talk a lot about public clouds and you're know, moving your, your infrastructure to public clouds, but what about those applications, right? Actually, that's the biggest conversation we're having with customers today is more about the risk that those new applications are, bring, are, are bringing. APIs are being exposed. It's another vector of, of data loss. Right? Think about IT, OT convergence. Is there anybody here who's in the oil and gas industry or manufacturing or healthcare or anything that, that has operational technology? You know what that means, right? So those, those critical business systems that are powering your business. Right, so those, those, that, that convergence, the two network converges have been happening for some time, but there's also new risks there. Industrial IoT is bypassing all the traditional security models and frameworks that we've had before. So that's, that's a new, new, new vectors of attack. Uh, they're starting to use cloud technology in that space, which, is, which has been unprecedented. And there's a lot of different insider risks that you have to consider. But then we got some of the newer things. Everybody heard about 5G and the big controversy with Huawei around the world and how people are looking at that and saying, well, uh, no, I've got infrastructure problems here. So more fundamental things are occurring with the 5G transformation, right? Things are gonna happen a lot faster. You're gonna have a lot more available data than you've ever had before. And just think about the amplified attacks that could be happening because of that new, that new connectivity. And then there's that big one, right, AI. Right? And there was a lot of myths. In fact, there was a study, I think, by National Cyber Center in the UK that looked at um, a number of you know, products on the market, I think like 2,000, and they claim to have AI, but they didn't have any AI at all, or even any machine learning, any sort of analytics. So it can be a buzz term, but you think about it in terms of risk, what is that really doing? Think about the influence operations that are happening within the election space, just, just, in, that there, just in that space alone, right? So it's eroding, you know, on the, on the downside, it's kind of helping an adversary erode trust in our institutions, road trust in everything that you, that you do. So there's a, those five vectors there, five kind of projects that are really we need to start considering. Right? How are we securing them? Can we, can we really take, this, take the same kind of approach? Can you really just say, let me just put up a firewall and some barriers? You really can't do that. You have to be as adaptable as, as the business is. You have to move at the speed of the business if you're in security today. You can no longer, you can no longer do that. I promise you I did have some slides up here. There would be some visualization, but <laughs> I'm not sure what's, what's happening, but... We'll, uh, we'll press on. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to, to reference, right, thinking about in terms of history, was, you know, okay, what is the strategy that we need to rethink to combat or to be part of that business, right, to enable that business to happen? And one is, is, a, is a strategy of resilience. You know, when, when I first started my, um, you know, I worked in, in, in government cyber for some time, and, and resilience was a common term. We talked about it in, a lot. We always had to operate through different situations. But when I came into working in, in, in industry or an enterprise, that was not such a common term. It was more about uh, put up the barriers, you know, put up the controls, you know, we need to prevent everything, we need to be very rigid and things. And actually that was the wrong, wrong strategy. We needed to be more adaptable. And there's a lesson learned from, you know, from what's happening in the Netherlands over the last 50 years or so. Right? And there's a project the last 10 years just concluded, it was called Room for the River. And I don't know if there's any Dutch 
in, in the room, okay? Maybe you're, maybe you're familiar with that project. You're certainly familiar with the risk that the Netherlands faces in terms of flooding, right? And you think about that, that uh, climate change. There couldn't be a more um, you know, riskier situation that we're all faced with. But you can't just stop it. You can't just prevent it. You have to be adaptable. You have to live with it. And, and the people in the Netherlands have learned to live with you know, their, the land conditions, the being below sea level with floods. So Room for the River was a strategy for resilience, working with the landscape, understanding how the rivers work together, bringing a agencies together. You know, so multiple agencies, hundreds of agencies actually, municipalities, central government, international organizations working together to create a project that didn't put up new dikes, it didn't put up new barriers, didn't put up higher dikes, it deepened the river, it widened things, it created floodplains, it created room for the river to flow through. In fact, in the city where I live, which is the Hague, right, they just completed a project underneath the city where, what you think, they build parking garages and the rivers can, the water can drain underneath the city. So there's a repository built into, let me skip ahead so you see. There we go. <laughs> so there's, there's a repository for the river. Right? And that's not, a, that's not a strategy of prevention. It's a strategy of adaptability. It's a strategy of resilience. Right? And I think everyone, I'd like everyone to consider that as they're, when they're going through their journey. If you're a CISO or if you're an advisor, an architect, a leader in your industry, and everyone can be a leader, I'd like you to think about how you can build a strategy for resilience for, for your organization. And, and, and resilience is more about adaptability than efficiency. Don't let anybody tell you different. Okay, so are, are we ready? Right, as an industry, who would, who would think that we're, that we're ready? Are you guys talking about that in your industry, in your, in your organization, in your business? Are you talking about being resilient or are you talking about being secure? Are you talking about rigid barriers and so forth? What are you guys talking about? And I, think, I really think that we are ready. And one of the things that, that, that one of the key indicators, the leading indicators that I think that, that are preparing us is that just this kind of conference, you know, the, the level of awareness in industry is high. When I first started, I had to go in and convince a senior leader or a senior manager or a senior person that they had a problem, right? You had to go talk about the statistics and, and all that kind of stuff. You don't really have to do that anymore. So the level of awareness, I mean, almost every industry, finance, government, you know, that they've had their aha moments a long time ago, right? But other industries, in the, say in the, in the industrial sector, if, if Stuxnet back in 2010 or other attacks on, say, the Ukrainian power grid over the last few years, Things that happened in Saudi Arabia, Shamoon, all those things were big aha moments for, for the industrial sector. If they haven't woken up, you know, they're, they're never going to change. Right? But then the rest of the industries, you know, WannaCry, Patia, those attacks that just happened just about two years ago, they were pretty big. There's, there's, a, there's attacks and there's breaches every single day, so I don't have to recite them. But those two things, WannaCry and Patia, were huge wake-up calls. In fact, on this morning, one of this morning's podcasts that I listened to, the CyberWire, it's a great daily podcast that gives you kind of an overview of things. And they talked about, just now, a company realizing the loss that they had from Patia, 2.2 million pounds, I think it was, after they finally calculated it. So it's still having its effect. So those aha moments have happened. I don't have to worry about that anymore. There's a lot of good, good awareness. So I think we're, I think we're getting there. The other, the other part is in the international institutions that we've put together. I'm going to play this video here. Right? This is of a, of a live takedown. Right? What the... The international institutions that we put together, those public-private partnerships are really starting to have an effect. They're really starting to, you know, to bear fruit. One was No More Ransom, started by, started by McAfee and a, and a number of, of uh, our partners in law enforcement and industry. And to date, we've saved over $10 million for, our, for those customers by providing free decryptors for, uh, for ransomware. 120 partners uh, are now in that, in that particular organization, law enforcement, other industry partners, government agencies, all kinds, of, all kinds of organizations are in that partnership today. So having a real impact. Right? Things like this, uh, where industry, government, you, you, this, uh, the industry government partnership is at an all-time high. Right? There's a lot of takedowns, working with telcos or governments, solving big problems. And this particular one, Operation Bakovia, was something with Europol, McAfee, and a number of other uh, agencies working together to really to br bring down uh, you know, ransomware campaign and command and control networks. It's happening a lot. Maybe you don't think about it, but that's an example of resilience. That's an example of, of partnerships and collaborations that are really working to have a big impact. Okay. The other area, I think, is in the regulation side. Right? So he thinks about things like, um, 
like GDPR or the NIST, and, uh, NIST framework and other, other regulations that are NIST directive that are coming out, they're having a huge impact. They're not telling you anymore to say, look, I just need to do my frameworks. I just need to put, I'm sorry, I just need to put in my controls, my firewall, my, my anti-malware, my, my data protection. They're telling you to take a risk management approach. So those, those regulations are really driving a more resilience, uh, a resilient approach than they ever have before. They're, they're kind of busting some of the myths that are out there in, uh, in, in terms of cyber. Okay. So how do we learn across the board? So I, looked, I went through a number of, uh, we'll say, industry reports to look for, to build kind of a scorecard. So there's a compilation, anything from PwC, Accenture, ISACA, SANS, a number of statistics. And I just picked out five, right, some of the key ones. So we're not doing too bad in terms of policy and, and, aware, and um, cybersecurity policy and privacy, that combination, but still 45% don't really have this together. Right? You're looking at uh, metrics. So I know I work closely with our CISO, his name is Grant Bazorkas. Uh, he's quite, quite known in the industry and he's a big believer in metrics. So I think what we're doing internally is great example, starting with metrics from the very beginning versus kind of bolting them on to the, at the end. But not a lot of people are, are, are doing that, so we need to improve that. Let's take a look at that through the Prezo. Incident response, this is, this is where I started my career in this area. I'm running uh, you know, computer emergency response teams, computer security incident response teams. Thus where I, so I still feel that grassroots effect here. So this really hits me at the heart. Right? I'm, mad, I'm mad that more than, only less than 50% have an incident response plan. So I wanna change that. I want all of you to change that. The other part is in, is in threat intel. And you might say, wow, that's a, that's a great number. 72% are using threat intel, you have threat intel. Yeah, you got a lot of data, but not, not a lot of process built around it. Not a lot of, you know, it's not really having the impact that you want in, uh, in, your, in terms of your cyber defense. It's not always impactful for incident response. So you've got to change that. A lot of data, a lot of people have the data, but they don't have the process. And, a, and another piece, which people kind of throw to the side, or right? you come up with security culture, ah, that's, that's kind of bull. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't work. That's wrong, right? We're going to dispel that myth today as well. But you look at this, so 33% so don't feel that they have a strong enough security culture. They might have awareness. You might have to take a test every year. You probably do, right? Once a year, I take a test, or twice a year, I take a couple of tests. Or, you know, once a year, I take five tests on phishing or, you know, data protection or what have you. That's not enough. We need to build a stronger culture. <clears throat> so let's look at it. What, what can we do from a, from an, I want to turn it internally to, to architecture, right? And again, I want to use an example from history, right? When you think of architecture, um, I heard this morning the Pantheon, I think that was one of, uh, there was a conversation about the Pantheon somewhere in this conference. I don't know who it was, but they mentioned that as being a great example of architecture. And I was like, I wish, damn, I wish I had a picture of the Pantheon. I'd be able to call that person out, right? But I, I'm, my example is about the Eiffel Tower, right? And everybody knows the Eiffel Tower. It's the most well-known uh, piece of architecture in, in the world. Built to last only 20 years, right? 18,000 pieces, right? Built to come apart, in a modular approach. They wanted to take it down after 20 years. After the World Fair, the intention was to take it down. Right? Did you know that it sways about seven, seven inches every year? It grows about 13 centimeters every year, grows and contracts with the, uh, with the weather conditions. Did you know that they conduct like 7,000 science experiments inside that? Do you know that over seven million people visit that every year and it's now a symbol over 130 years of, uh, of, of French culture? Right, most recognizable symbol. So think about that for an architecture concept, adaptable. Think of all the weather conditions it's had to endure the last years, right? Un uncanny. Think of all the, the, the political situations that it's had to endure over the years. Think about its form and function. It's not just a piece of, a piece of metal. It's something that drives culture and image for, and reputation for France. It's something that delivers back to the scientific community, something that serves millions of visitors every year. And a great example of architecture, right? What do we get in cyber? We get this. <laughs> this is what we usually get when we think about cybersecurity. We get this mess. There's no form and function. There's a lot of complexity. A lot of things don't work together. What does that result in? Does that result in your business being around for 130 years? To being adaptable, to, being, you know, to serving millions of customers every year? No. It results in you losing a lot of money. It results in you losing your reputation. So there's a whole bunch of architecture myths that we have to dispel, right? This whole thing is about culture change. I love what you're doing at this conference because it is about culture change. So I wanna, I wanna offer up a, an opportunity for somebody in the audience to, be, to help me be a, a myth buster. Okay, so I have five myths here. 
right? And I want to I bust these myths today before we leave. I want you to think about them. So I need, I need at least one volunteer. Who's going to be first? Who wants to be my first myth buster? Chris. Oh, I have a volunteer. That's really easy. <laughs> volunteer. <laughs> All right, take one. Take one. Any card. Anyone. Any Just card. read it. Okay, read it. Can I read? Mm -hmm. What does it say? Sock in a box. Oh, my favorite. I love that one. Right? Again, by heart. I'm an instant responder. I love you know, being, uh, being in the midst of, uh, of detection and response and investigations, and this one really kills me. Right? Have, any, have, uh, raise your hand. Be safe. It's a safe environment. Have anybody used that term? No one's used that term? I know you're lying. You've all used it. And there's, any vendors in the room? You've used it. I've heard it. I've seen it in your commercials right? a lot of times. So somebody's lying. I know you're using it, but it really kills me. You know why it's a myth? Because of what it says is just buy, my, buy this box, and you've got a sock. Buy this box and you have detection and response. That is not true. There's a lot of things, a lot of people, process, and technology that go into giving you an effective detection and response capability. So let's bust that myth. And if you hear anybody saying it, I'm going to give you my phone number and you can call me. So I need a couple of other myth busters. Any other? Oh, another volunteer? Where's the microphone? Oh, another good one. Who believes in that? Anybody here believe that compliance equals security? There's a lot of people out there, at least over 50%, statistically still believe that this is the approach. Now, we, ha we do have a benefit in that the current regulations are really changing this, right? They're really driving that risk management. But for so long, this checkbox approach has driven your architecture, and we need to, we need to get rid of that. So there's a, let's, let's move on from that piece. Okay, thank you. So I have a couple more. Who wants to be another myth buster? <gasps> Got another volunteer. I love it. <laughs> just, oh, yeah, just. Yeah. Mo Cashman is a silly guy. Uh, sorry. <laughs> that, is a, that is a myth. <laughs> <This> is a myth. <laughs> no, no, I am silly, actually. <laughs> Security architecture is technical problem. <sighs> Whoa. Let's throw that out, right? Let's get rid of that, right? We don't want that anymore, yeah. right? It's not a technical problem, right? In fact, one of the classes that we teach or that we, one of the certifications that we do inside of uh, McAfee with our architects, and I, I had the privilege of leading that team, is a certification called IASA, right? International Association of Software Architects. And that doesn't teach anything about technology. It teaches all about the business, how to engage with your stakeholders, how to think like them, how to understand the business models before you start designing stuff, right? So that's very, very important. Architecture, there is technology be behind it, but that technology is not going to deliver the benefit, right, unless you engage with the stakeholders and understand that. I see so many meetings fail, so many customer engagements fail because the guy just starts with the technology, right? I, I have time for one more. So I'll get one more myth buster. All right. All the guys in the front, they're volunteering. <laughs> That's very cool. Security is an IT problem. <gasps> oh, Mark, give me that. Give me that. Give me that thing. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. We don't want. The, sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> but that's true. Security is not. A, that's, that is a myth. Security is not is not an IT problem. It's everybody's problem, right? You should be responsible. You're responsible for securing the for securing the company's data, right? And one of the things that we did, going back a few years even, in in the first company that I worked with was. One of the first industries that I worked with was we, made, we took security out of a central operation and put it out into the business uh, environments. We created liaisons. We it made the network operations center responsible for configuring everything. Right? So making sure, and we, we made sure that people got certified. We funded a certification program. So that's, pretty, that's like where you want to get, you know, security is just not this one central place. You've got to, uh, you've got to distribute that. <coughs> I apologize, I was getting over a bit of bronchitis the last, few, the last few months, actually, after a trip to San Francisco, and I got a little bit choked up there. <laughs> so excuse me, I just want to catch my breath. Whew. Okay, so myths, we busted those, right? We busted a few, there's probably a lot more, and if you have any, please come up to me and talk to me about that, right, as we go through the conference. I would love to hear more about the myths that you're seeing out there, the things that you want to change, the behavior that you want to change inside of the community. Okay, so what do we need to do? Right, what do we need to do to enable transformation? 
One is you gotta, you've got to get bis- better visibility over your data, right? And, and increasingly, you need to have those cloud native controls to get that visibility, right? So there's about 20 some percent of sensitive in, uh, information in, that's stored in the cloud by, by statistical analysis. This is one of the surveys that, that we've done recently. And you might, not, you might say, well, that's not a lot. Right? 20 percent, that's not a lot. Just think of how many billions of files are out there. You know, and just, you know, one of those breaches could cost you you're quite a bit of money. <clears throat> so you've got to know where that data resides as well. And what's happening is, you know, when you share a link with someone, say you, you have a SharePoint or you have OneDrive, what have you, you share, you share some piece of data with somebody and you give them a link. How many, who, how many people have done that? And I know everybody's done that, so if you don't raise your hand, I know you're, you're fooling yourself, okay? So you, everybody has sent a link to somebody to, to a piece of data. You know, where does that link go after you send it? What if he forwards it to somebody else, right? What if he forwards it to somebody else? And that, and that permissions on that were anybody who has, has this link can access the data. You've just basically busted your, your security policy. So having those, those cloud controls and the visibility is very, very important. Uh, another piece is in, you know, when you think about managing risk, you know, I mentioned frameworks, and I don't want to cover NIST or things of that nature because I think you guys know that. But we'll look at the, at the MITRE framework because I think that gives you a three-dimensional approach to, to helping measure those, uh, you measure your risk. That last piece there, re- reducing your mean time to whatever, respond, detect, investigate, validate, lots of different things that can be, that can be uh, talked about there. So reducing that mean time to, to, um, to contain an incident is very, very important. And again, that goes back to that sock in the box mix, uh, sock, sock in the box myth. Um, if you don't do that right, you're not gonna reduce that time frame. And I think that the other piece here, and I just wanna highlight one thing, is a, a strategy for, for analytics, right? So analytics is, is, about an, is, is part of your automation capability, right? So finding, using things like machine learning to detect user anomalies, using things like machine learning to prevent some sort of new threat at the endpoint of the network, right? But think about a strategy for that, right? It's not just a, you know, a, um, a feature in a, in a certain product, but you think about how you're using that across the board for detection, for prevention, for investigations, for discovery, for understanding, for risk analysis. There's many applications for analytics and it's not just in prevention of malware. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So look at from a, you know, what is McAfee doing in this space? And I'll look at a simplistic design of architecture, device and cloud. Those are the controls that we're focusing in on because that's where your data is. That's where the main threats are. That's where the main points of visibility. Covering those different attack surfaces at the endpoint, covering them at the cloud level. Those are the key points. That's where you're working. And that's where, the, that's where we have to put the controls. So that's where we've made a lot of investments over the last years in terms of uh, our security portfolio and architecture. We invested a lot in management. So being able to simplify policies across those different devices, those different operating environments to give you unified, unified data protection unified threat management across those, across those different attack vectors and, and kind of unified visibility of what's happening with your data and your, and your threats in those different environments. And then finally, security operations. And this is really uh, an area we'd like to go a little bit further into, right? Think about that, because that that's one of our key myths, right? We can't just have security operations to be a box. Well, you got to think about the telemetry, right? You got to think about where do I get in the right visibility to detect something? This is pretty critical. If you've ever had a SIM project that's failed, it's mainly because you didn't have the right visibility first, right? It's probably the main cause. The second piece is in threat intel. And threat intel is not just about IOCs and things, it's about understanding the attack vectors and methods, right? We have some of our partners here at Threat Quotient. Um, where they help you manage threat intelligence, make it a process, integrate it and automate some of the key things there. So take a look if you can visit those those guys, uh, they integrate greatly or well with the McAfee portfolio and, uh, and open architecture. <coughs> Sorry. Analytics, again, looking at user behavior, network analytics, um, risk analysis, areas where you can you know, uh, drive a faster detection and response capability by using analytics. And then finally, process automation. So everybody thinks about, okay, just uh, categorizing my incident response process, and that's there. But what about investigations and containment? There's a lot of areas to consider when you want to reduce that mean time to respond in, 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 in terms of security operations. So, okay, 
look at that framework, right, the MITRE framework. And a lot of people think about, okay, yeah, this is about measuring endpoint security. This is about measuring end, you know, endpoint detection and response. And that's true, it's happening, but it's not what it's intended for. It's intended to measure your security capability across the board. It's intended to give you more visibility into, uh, or, or more depth of information into what kind of capability you should have. So it kind of breaks down that kill chain a little bit further, gives you a lot of different techniques and indicators within each of these particular categories, and really tells you where, where do I have. Because if I just looked at this and I said, well, I have, I have controls in all these different areas, it's kind of a two-dimensional approach. Right, it's not really what we need. So this is really this is something you can use to build use cases. You can measure your capability uh, and also to kind of you know fit into that metrics program a little bit better. An idea, you know, adversary emulations is the same thing, right? It was part of the framework. So thinking like the attacker, right? Modeling their processes, you know, and doing this repeatedly. So instead of saying how am I protected against said malware, right, which had these you know, very you know, innocuous name. Think about how I'm protected against this kind of adversary. That's more important. Okay. Some of the differences that we see in our architecture that fit into those that design ethos. I'm not going to go through all these here, but one thing I'd like to highlight is the open architecture piece. So we've had a design philosophy for many years that we have to integrate with things. We have to drive a customer adaptability, and that's one of the things that we're that we really believe in. We have over 150 partners that are part of our architecture, can work together well, and that's really one of the big differentials that, that we see. I think they're coming to get me. <laughs> I am scared, but <laughs> let's look at the last piece here, right? Because I don't want to, I don't want to miss this one, because culture is very, very important, right? And it's, 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 it's the strength of, of, of your organization. I don't want you to forget that. There's a couple of big myths here, but as I see the police are here, last episode, I'd like to, I'm not going to jail alone, so I'd like to invite all the McAfee people to come up stage with me. <laughs> oh, McAfee, come on, come on, hurry up. We're all going to jail. <laughs> so one of the things we believe in McAfee is, is together is power. It's a very strong cultural ethos that we have in our company. So if you have a chance to meet one of these great people during the conference, please do. Um, and I want to thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be the opening speaker here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. Great.